It's a great honor and a privilege to introduce Ellie Brown. Uh, your maiden name was Schlesinger. Schlesinger. And you were born in Austria. In Vienna. In Vienna. Yes. What year were you born? Oh dear, 1924. 24. June 13th, 1924. And you came from a very firm family? Yes, Orthodox. I couldn't say very, yeah. Orthodox family, yes. And Eddie, what did your, 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 your father do? Well, my father was the most interesting man. He had always very, very good ideas and he had partners and the partners were the ones that were successful financially. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and they used my father's talents and uh, we didn't have much money. But I can't ever say that I missed out on something, no. I went to a Jewish school for most of my school years. Actually, six years I went to Jewish school. And for two years I had to go to public school because my parents couldn't afford the uh, the money that we had to pay for a private Jewish school. And this is as far as my formal education went because then Hitler came and when I was 14 and then I had to flee. But I was very lucky because my father always retained his Hungarian citizenship that gave me a very, very easy time to leave Vienna, 1938, without, without problems. No, and can, uh, can, I, can I ask, do you yes. remember the name of your school? Of the... the name of the school was called Talmud Torah. It was in, in the second uh, Bezirk. In the, the second Zetia. district? Second district, Malzgasse. Uh, yes, there were actually only two Jewish schools in Vienna with a Jewish population of 180,000 no. Jews, which was actually a very sad thing for so many Jews, only two schools. And one was the one I went to, was a very, very orthodox school. The other one was called the Zionist school, where well, half of the children did not come from such religious families, but the parents apparently wanted the children to go and have a Jewish education. So only two Jewish schools? Only 280,000 Jews. It was a mess. In hindsight, I was thinking that it is the most, almost incredible that a was no other Jewish education oh. in Vienna. And did you live in the Jewish quarter? In yes, the I Jewish... lived right, right in the middle of the Jewish quarter, which was called Große Schiffgasse. And there was in our street, across, diagonally across the street, was the most orthodox synagogue, which was called Schiff Schul. And uh, they had uh, more than one rabbi. Rabbi First was really the head rabbi. And they had several chazanim. And it was at the most prestigious orthodox and strictest orthodox synagogue. In Vienna? In yeah. Vienna, yes. And you grew up, did you have uh, any siblings? Yes, I had only one sister. She was three years older than I am. And she was a very, very intelligent girl. She always got the best marks in school. I did not. I was just about average. But uh, she was very, very smart. And Ella, can I ask, growing up, when yes. you were in the Jewish school, did yes. you, in the area that you lived, did you have many Jewish friends or did you only, have any? Only, only. Actually, Jewish, yes, I had all Jewish friends because in our building, I lived in a four-story building, they were all Jewish uh, uh, tenants and practically the entire street were mostly Jewish stores. Mm -hmm. And I would say that the, all the Jewish stores were closed, closed on Shabbat. Maybe they were not religious, but they certainly could not keep this out. It was a uh, out of prestige, they had to cl had to close their stores. Yes, yes. And when? How old were you when you went to the public school? Uh, I went for second and third grade to public school because but my parents couldn't afford to pay the uh, 
the uh, the fees yeah the f- the fees yes and then when we were had to go back again to the to the Jewish school I was quite upset because once uh, once I got used to the Jewish to the public school I felt already very comfortable there although on the Jewish school the non Jewish public school was also six days a week but on Saturday there was school but in our neighborhood. First of all, one could carry on the Sabbat. It was Erev. A natural Erev was the Danube Canal was was there, but in the school itself, the Jewish children did not have to write on the Sabbat, so there was no problem, and there were the majority, almost all the children were Jewish. In the public school. In the public school, yes. Maybe we had thirty children. Maybe twenty six were were Jewish. Yes. So you had Jewish, it was Jewish friends, just a, even in yeah, the public yeah, school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But my parents didn't care if they were religious or not. They were very, very open minded. So yeah, I had my best friend wasn't even kosher. My parents didn't mind one bit. They were very, very liberal. Just for us, we were strict, but. They didn't mind one bit with whom I played and so. Oh. And you had a happy childhood growing up, what you remember? Yes, I had a happy childhood because my grandparents lived across the street, my mother's parents. And my mother had seven siblings and my mother was the second oldest and the first one to get married. And they all got married much, much, much later. So I felt very, very safe and beloved from all my uncles and my aunt. And it was sort of my grandparents was my second home. And we felt very secure and beloved there, yes. And when when the Anschluss happened, when Germany took over Austria, yeah. when they when Hitler it came to, it was a terrible shock. Do, do you remember? Do you of remember? Of course, I happened? remember. I was fourteen years old at that time, and I know that for sure. There was supposed to be uh, what's what called? I forgot the name of in in, in, in English. There was supposed to be vote. There was supposed to be a vote. But uh, a referendum, a type, a type of referendum. Pardon? A referendum. No, no vote. A vote. A vote, and the Germans didn't give the Austrians a chance to vote. They marched in before the elections. It was supposed to be elections, yes, and that was uh, March twelfth or March thirteenth, nineteen thirty-eight, and it was a. Terrible, terrible shock because our non Jewish neighbors from one day to the next they wore SS uniform, SRSA uniform, and we were very, very shocked. All from suddenly they became the Hitler youth and the hit and the Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler was all over the place, and the, and the German flags, which was called the Hakenkreuz, I forgot what it's the, called. The, uh, it was the emblem, the that, Nazi emblem. So that's right, it was all over. The red over. and black. It was all over, and it was a terrible, not just a shock, it was. Uh, everybody was very, very, very upset. And Do you remember the Germans marching into yes, Vienna? Yes, yeah, of course, yes, yeah, yeah. And the most shocking was that the neighbors who were. The neighbors who helped us out a little bit in the house, all of a sudden there were the German uniforms with the cross, with the Hakenkreuz. It was very, very, very frightening, from really from one day to the next. And what, what made your parents decide to leave? Did they see the so-called writing on of the wall? Of course, of course. First of all, uh, most Jewish stores had to close. This was, was very, very bad. And we were very, very fortunate because my father was Hungarian citizen, so we were children, Hungarian, Hungarian citizen. And then we were able to leave the country without a, without the visa, let's say, to 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 get out. Without a visa without an exit visa also. So on 
I left, no, I left in July 1900, I left July 12th, I think, July 12th, 1938, and I was 14 at the time. I was able to get a Hungarian passport, and I was able to get to Bratislava, where I had two aunts, which was Pressburg, Czechoslovakia at the time. And I was able to leave, and as I said, went to over to my grandparents. I was 14 at the time, and said goodbye to my grandparents and to my uncles. And they all said, Ellie, you're so lucky that you can leave, and they wished they could leave, but Apparently, at that particular time, it was impossible for them because no Austrian country wanted open their gates to the Jews. So it was very, very difficult for them to leave. Eventually, most of my uncles were able to go to America because one of my uncles had some relatives who were able to send them affidavits, which is guaranteed that they come. So they were very fortunate they were able to go, yes, except for two of my aunts, they could not go, yes. And what happened to those two aunts? Well, one was a one, they all had families, they had, each one had one child. One was able to survive under very, very difficult circumstances. She was hiding, they were, she was hiding in the Tatra. Tatra is a, a very big, wait a minute, um, what do you call it? Forest, for, forest in, in Czechoslovakia, more than forest, I forgot what you call it. Oh, like a big, big, big forest in, a, in, a, in the Czechoslovakia. And she went through, I would call it hell, unfortunately. She lost her husband and her only child, especially the child was under terrible circumstances. And the other aunt, uncle with the child, we never heard from them again. We knew what happened to them. I'm not so sure that they even were sent to Poland, that they were taken care of in Czechoslovakia themselves, I don't, we don't know. They could have been killed in Czechoslovakia? Yeah, that is very possible. And my, grand, my grandparents from Vienna were also in Bratislava, and I would say very fortunately that my grandfather was able to die in Nitra, which is not far wow. from Bratislava, and he has a Jewish grave. And unfortunately, my grandmother, with her, my aunt and the family, were deported to Poland. And uh, we all know what happened over. We all know what happened over there. I was extremely, extremely attached to my grandparents when I was a child. I think I had the best, best, best summer when I went with my grandparents on vacation. When I was 12 years old, we went to Hungary and uh, I went swimming with my grandfather and I took, we took long walks and my grandmother just needed to rest. She was a very, very tired, but she was reading nonstop. They were both very, very, very intelligent people. And I was very, very close to them. Also, my sister was very close to them. And, and can I just ask you, when you went to Bratislava, yes. to Pressburg, yes. did you go with your sister and no, your parents? No, not all by myself. And what happened to your sister? Where did she... No, the thing was, my sister was three and a half years older than I. My sister was engaged to this, to this, uh, her wife, so to say. She was going to get married for sure to him mm -hmm. later, but the circumstances were such that it would have, was really the best thing that they would get married the sooner the better. So they both, my, my, my brother-in-law, or future brother-in-law, went to Italy. He got a visa to Italy. Uh -huh. And my sister, who had a Hungarian passport, was able to get 
to Switzerland without a visa. And from Switzerland, she went to Italy, which he was very close to the Italian border. And she was able to, I don't know how, she was extremely capable. And somehow she was able to get him a visa to, I don't know how, what, what, to go to Switzerland. And then my parents came quickly from Czechoslovakia to Switzerland because they wanted my sister brother they should get married as quickly as, as possible. They would have gotten married later but the circumstances yeah. were such that she was only 17 and a half that they, they got married. In the meantime I was in Bratislava by myself with my aunt and my uncle and it looked like the Germans were going to invade Czechoslovakia also. So since I had a Hungarian passport, my parents sent me a telegram from Switzerland. I should come immediately to Switzerland because they were afraid I should get stuck in, in Czechoslovakia. So with 14, I was a very, very independent girl, independent person, out of necessity. And I went, by, went from Pressburg, Bratislava, back to Vienna. I saw my grandparents the last time. And from there, I went and took a night train to Switzerland. All by yourself? All by myself. I got the ticket all by myself. At the age of 14? Pardon, at age 14. Very courageous. I went to, yes, I grew up. I was very lucky because I grew up to be a very independent And you person. weren't scared? You weren't, you weren't scared? Or? Maybe I was scared, but I just must have overcome the, the fear because I did it without a problem. And I came to Switzerland. I took the night train to Switzerland. What, what day, do you remember the date roughly? Yes, when? yes, yes. October 6th. No, 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 no. To go to Switzerland was about maybe September 1st, 1938. So I came to Switzerland and to tell the truth, that was the, most, the unhappiest time in my life, really. When you were in Switzerland? Yes, because my sister had just gotten married with this... With, with this uh, my parents were very, very, very busy because my father was a very, My father read the book Mein Kampf, did I say it already? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he took it very, very seriously. The Mein Kampf, uh, Hitler's yes. Mein Kampf. Yeah, he wrote yes, to this. Hitler's book. He took it very, very seriously. And he decided, he, he, was, he spoke at a social democratic forum in Zurich, at a forum. He spoke, he was the speaker. And they told him that I, when he spoke, that he read the book Van Kampf and he took it very seriously and he is really afraid that Hitler meant every word he wrote in his book. That today Germany, tomorrow the entire world. This is what Hitler wrote. And and for a foreigner, like my father was in Switzerland, to be politically active at that time was a major crime in Switzerland. So, my parents had to sort of say to leave from one day to the next. They were just shipped out, but luckily my parents had got a visa, a business visa to Belgium, because my father was already from Vienna, went once in a while to Belgium, he was in the diamond business. And they got, both got my parents a business visa, but they could not take me along as a 14-year-old child, as a business, I couldn't get a business. So they had to leave from one day to the next and they had to find a Jewish family for me to stay. In the meantime, until my parents thought they were able to take me to Belgium, to get me a visa to Belgium. So they thought, so they thought, and that was their real intention. So my mother had to go, went with me, to this Jewish community center where there was a uh, organization that helped uh, refugees and so forth. And there was this lady that 
found a place for me. That very day, my parents had to leave that very night, and they had to find a place for me to stay until my parents could take me to Belgium. And what, what town was it in Switzerland? Pardon? Which town? Yeah, in Zurich, in Zurich. In, Zurich. In, in Zurich, yes. So my parents had to find a place for me to stay until they get, get wow. me to Belgium. My mother went with me to this Jewish community center where was a uh, help help the refugees. And sure enough, this lady who was in charge there found a place for me to be placed in Lucerne with a Jewish family. And they called them up, would you take this girl for, until she can get to Belgium for them? And they said, yes, they're willing to do this. It wasn't so funny at that time, really. And my parents took me to the train station on a Thursday evening, October 6, 1938, yes. And the same evening, my parents had to leave and went to, went to Belgium. and. They said to me, as soon as they can, they will get me then to to Belgium. So I lived with this family, and I was terribly, terribly, terribly unhappy. Because at home, I had my grandparents, of course, mm -hmm. they, they, they gave me a lot of attention, which a child, a young person needs. And uh, with the grandparents, with my parents, I felt very secure at home. All of a sudden, I was thrown into a family that I didn't know. And I would say, not that I'm, I'm actually, I'm saying grateful to the people that they took me in. However, it was a very, very dif different mentality. And they were very cold and very... Uh, what should I say? Cold. That's good. That's good enough. You know, what I what I was used to be with my uncles and my aunts and the family and so. And as I said, we never had. We didn't have much money, but I had a tremendous amount of mm -hmm. love and attention from my family. And all of a sudden, I was thrown into this family. I would say in hindsight that I'm ever so grateful they took me in. I don't want to take this away, but the mentality was so different. And truthfully, always, I was always hungry. It was not their fault. It, if they gave me every morning, I got like everybody else, two slices of bread with a little jam and a little juice. And I probably, in my mind, I could have eaten 25 slices of bread. But just because I was a lot of two slices of bread, I was forever, ever, ever, ever hungry. And it was such a different mentality. There was so cold and so I don't did, know. Did they have children? Yeah, they had two children, yes. Your age or no, some age? No, that's his age. My boy was three and one was six. And I had to stand up with it. I had to sleep with the two boys in one room. And that was for me, what should I say, a, a shock actually. And we at home, we didn't have much money, but we had, uh, had my sister and I, we had one room and uh, to get to together, and I had my privacy. Which is all, no, yes, privacy. all of a sudden, the children they looked at me. Not I had very little things anyway, but they looked at it and they touched it and it, and I was. I grew up to be very respectful to also my sister's things, my parents' things. I knew I don't touch. I don't. If I want something, I have to ask. May I take this or may I have this? And they just messed up. Not that I had very, very little, but the little things that I had was very precious to me and very personal and private. So I, it was quite a, a, a shock to me. It was also a, a culture shock, this, 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 Swiss, this, this whole thing in Switzerland. However, I would say I made there a friendship that lasted almost a lifetime. Because I met a, I met a family that was very, very, very nice. That they had actually three sons, three daughters. One girl was my age, and I met them in the synagogue. I was introduced in the synagogue, and it was probably really a lifetime friendship that I was ever so grateful to them. And I had. 
British family that I lived with, I had no money altogether. There was a lady, a non-Jewish lady, her name was Mrs. Sachs, who made it her, who worked for the children as a voluntary person, uh, taking care of refugee children, so to say. And she was a very, very kind person. And I could go once a month to her, and she would give me, uh, to give me a little bit of money, some money. I wasn't used to accepting money, so it was a very, very strange way. But I had no choice. I had just had, because my sister lived in Zurich, and I really wanted to very, very, very much go to visit her once in a while or once a month. And she gave me, she gave me a free ticket to, to to a train ticket to go to to go to Zurich. She was really an unbelievable woman, a who took care of refugee children out of the kindness of her heart. And she was the one, she was, so to say, my mentor. And she was a non-Jewish lady? Non-Jewish, before uh, a, a, a Swiss lady? A Swiss lady, and I was forever so grateful to her, yes. She made it her business to help Jewish children. But I met another lady, so while I, while I was in Lausanne, there was another lady who offered, she's willing to give French lessons to uh, refugee children. So I had learned French already in Vienna from our neighbor. Private, private. my parents didn't have much money, but it was very important for my father that we should learn French. And there was this lady, Madame Krenbühl, she was a Huguenot. Have you know? Sure, the yeah. Huguenots came to South Africa. Exactly, yeah. I never knew about those things. As well. And she was a, a princess because she offered, she's willing to teach refugee children French for free. She wanted to do something. So I went to her once a week and she was like my surrogate mother. She was the kindest, nicest, Finest. I, there's no words how grateful I am to for the rest of my life. How she, how understanding she was. Not only did she give me French lessons, but mainly she understood my uh, unhappiness, so to say, because she was a total outsider, and she was just an angel. There's no way I could say how grateful I am to for the rest of to her for the rest of of my life, and not only she taught me she taught me some French, but what she did for me is just unbelievable. That her kindness is will be forever, never forgotten. Madame Crémeville was was her name. So I was there in Lausanne for. And I thought, when the war broke up, September, broke out September 1st, did I say it already? 1939. I was so unhappy and I was so distraught that I wrote to my parents to Belgium and I wrote them every week. But I was so, so I wrote them saying, I don't know if I'll ever see you again because I was so full of heartaches and, and hopeless and so. but. God wanted it in a different way. In February 1900, so I, I didn't think I'd ever see my parents again. I was very, very unhappy. And in February 40, 1940, this lady, Mrs. Sachs, who took care of volunteer of the children, called me up to this family that I worked for and said, Ellie, I can get you. The, the war had broken out already five months, a few months before. I can get you a visa to go to Belgium. And what you have to get, I can get you a tra transit visa through France. And then you, I'll, I'll organize it for you that you can go to Paris from Zurich with a train to Paris, stay overnight in Paris, 
And then you can send your parents a cat telegram to Belgium, that from Paris to Belgium, that you will be coming to Belgium. And I'll organize for you, for you to stay, to stay with this family. And because you have, because you have, like after you arrive in Paris, like 45 minutes later, mm -hmm. there's no way you can change the train and go on this, you don't know you where. So she organized it for me, and I was ever so grateful for her. And as I go into the, go into the train, it was, and I spoke quite well French, there was a man sitting next to me, and I told him the story straight up. I told him the story that I will be arriving in in Paris. I will be arriving in Paris and I have a place where to stay overnight to get the train. The war was on already. And the, to, to, the next day I would go with this train to, to Brussels or to, to go to Antwerp. So he said, is that so? I will help you, miss. We'll arrive in Paris with the train and I will run with you to the other train station and help you that you will have the ticket, that you will not have to stay in Paris overnight for the next train. You will be able to catch the train in the other station and go straight and to, to Belgium. So I trusted this man, you know, he was very nice. As we arrived in Paris, he ran out of the train with my suitcase. I mean, no, 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 it worked out well. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I, I felt I could trust this guy. You know, I told him my story. In fact. And he ran with my suitcase and with me to the other train station, pushed the suitcase into the train, pushed me into the train, and the train flew off. I couldn't even say thank you to him. All of a sudden, I was in the train to Belgium. I couldn't, I was bewildered. I was just bewildered. And my parents didn't have the faintest idea that was coming, not the faintest idea. I was supposed to, I thought I was going to send them a telegram from Paris. All of a sudden, they get, it was in, in Brussels, and that take the train to, to Antwerpen. My parents didn't have the faintest idea. And I got come, come to Antwerpen and I take a taxi, Lamefoot Strat 46, where my parents I had written to them every single week, you know, and got a letter from them. And I say, go and sit in the taxi. And as I say in the taxi, you know, you look out you're in a strange city, I see my parents walking. Wow. They didn't have the faintest idea that I was coming. So I opened the window quickly of the taxi and I screamed, Mama, Papa. So the driver stopped and screamed. And, and then these people heard, heard somebody scream, scream, scream. And they, st they stopped who screaming like that. I met my parents and they didn't have the faintest idea I was coming. There is no way I can describe you what it was. What an excitement and how thrilled my parents were, and I, of course, needless to say. I was three months in, per in, in Antwerpen. I only realized when I saw how my parents lived, how poorly they lived, and how I would almost call it pathetic, you know, that I realized why they were not in a hurry to let me come. However, I had three months of bliss. My parents didn't know what to do for me, how to spoil me with their attention, with their attention, with their, their love. And it was an unbelievable three months, but everything worked out for the best. Because three months later, the Germans invaded Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg. This is Luxembourg, that's right. And it was very, very fortunate that I was together with my parents. Because we fled, the Germans invaded on Friday, 
and we moved in we moved in because my parents lived a little bit outside where the, right near the military airfields were so we moved in into the inner city we had some friends there family friends and there was a lady with a little boy and she was highly pregnant and her husband was taken away because they were Austrian citizens which were alien, enemy aliens and they all had to be uh, they were all were taken away they didn't she didn't know where they were being t actually they were sent into the south of France but she this is a story yes out out of Russia to, to, to France so she was very very happy we moved into her we were able to help her she was had this little boy and she was quite pregnant already in eight nine months so we fled together with her because the Germans invaded Belgium and everybody thought the French had had uh, put millions and millions and millions of dollars into the fortification which yeah. was called the marginal line. Is the line yeah. yeah. However the Germans were smart enough, they circumvented it and they went around the marginal line. There was not one single shot fired in this fortification that they put in millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars in. They they were bent around it and so but we fled we fled and everybody thought oh no time will we be able the Germans will be defeated and we'll be able to go back to Belgium. This is what people thought. Of course it turned out completely differently. Yeah. So we fled with this lady, Mrs. Rabinovich. We fled her with her. We, we fled on Monday. And where did you go? To the we didn't know. <laughs> we thought we were going to the border. But in the end, we ended up in the south of France. Yeah, because the German, there was no radio, there was no, there was, everything was taken over by the German. So we really, nobody knew what was really, 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 really going on. We were in a total, uh, what should I say, uh, blind. We didn't know. We had nobody, we didn't know. The Germans had taken over the, the yeah. So we were in a train with this lady, she was like that. From Monday afternoon, and they started bombarding them in Antwerpen, the station while we were there. But thank God nothing happened to us. We were in the train from Monday till Saturday night. And I, I didn't have a seat. I didn't have a seat because there was such a terrible crowd in the train. I had to sit on a suitcase in the aisle. So everybody, somebody wanted to, had to go through. I had a go. That's how I was sitting from Monday till Saturday night on a suitcase. But I felt so sorry for my parents because my mother's feet got so swollen it's just because sitting sitting like that for six days and six nights was really very really very difficult difficult well the, the, the train stopped here or stopped there so we were, we were very oh, this is back. we were very very lucky because on some places the Red Cross stopped and they brought us, there was no plastic at that time. Mm -hmm. There was not yeah. on the horizon mm -hmm. yet. Yeah, was, uh, so, uh, I don't know what they brought it us, in paper cups, or, I forgot, some some black coffee. So we were very thrilled, you know, some black coffee, and they brought uh, on some places the Red Cross. So in principle, we had nothing or some, some 
stops, they had maybe a sandwich or something. But we just, the train was so crowded, there were, I don't know. Was it mainly, pardon? Were, were many Jews on the train? Yes, yes. It was many the Jews. The Jews, most of the Jews tried to flee yeah. because they were afraid. But we were sure we're coming back, the Germans will be defeated, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but a lot of non-Jews too, but yes. And we became, while we were on this train, we became be befriended with a couple and two boys. They were from Düsseldorf, Germany. They had two boys, one was 11 and one was 9 or something. That is a special story. Did it, did this, is special, this is a very special story. So we became, finally, we finally, we, we were on the train from Monday till on Saturday wow. night. And so my father was a doer always, yes. I said he always was thinking what should he do, or something interesting. Now. So my father, this is but decided, had an idea, he will, it, it's his invention, you know there's now toothbrushes, electric toothbrushes, is my father's patent. Really? Yeah, but not electric, manual. Now later on they made it, yeah. there's a bug flying That's here. Okay. If you can catch it, <laughs> oh, you can. <laughs> that is my father's patent. Really? So while we were in France in this godforsaken place, where we slept on straw all the time, my father was always doing things with his head, always. It was never made a lot of money, I'm just telling you, but it was always working. So he patented this toothbrush in Toulouse. Yes, Toulouse. You went to Toulouse? Yeah, we didn't live far from Toulouse. We all the way in the south of, you know where Toulouse is, I'm sure. So we, we were actually south of Toulouse. The train went... But you didn't know where you were going? You just went on a train that just... No idea, because all the train stations were covered because they were afraid of the Germans. Who could... We met this car, we befriended this mm -hmm. car, right? with two boys. On the train? On the train. See, we were just thrown mm. together like that. I told you I didn't have a seat, I was sitting in a suitcase. We finally arrived in this place. They took off six, three trains here, three trains here. Three. So we arrived in this place. I forgot what the name was. And there was uh, two buses waiting. This was in the south of France? Yeah, the south. Near we had Toulouse. no idea where we were. It was all covered, everything, because of the German. And we were down in the, uh, we were two buses, and they took us, we had no idea where we would be, to a, to a place. And they put us up in a, what do you call it? In a schoolhouse, but a school in a, what do you call it? Condemned building, and condemned building already. On, uh, on straw, <laughs> and we were maybe like 35 people in one schoolroom and 35 people. Who cares? My mother just wanted to stretch her feet, her feet was just, 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 just. And so what happened? So we could finally stretch ourselves out and we got to sleep. So the next morning, we had no idea where we were. We knew we were in France, but the thing was very fortunate that my papa spoke quite well French, and 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 I also I had learned it, you know. Mm -hmm. And that was very very fortunate. We could already write or we converse. So the first thing is we had to go. And we had very first. Of my parents were poor refugees already, you know. So we had very little money. But first thing we went in and and we had we could uh, we could make ourselves understood. We had some black coffee and we brought it to my mother, but I forgot already the next story. So we were there on open straw and 
My father was always an interesting, very interesting. Who man. arranged that you should go to this uh, school? The government. The, the French government? Yeah, the French government. So they really helped? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And they provided the coffee, the... No, they did not. They didn't provide anything. They didn't provide it. Just provided the old con the condemned schoolhouse or whatever it was, with straw for the people. They did not provide anything so else. How did you, how did you get food? How did? You had a little money. Most people had yes, a, little a little bit of something. I mean, so as I said, my father was a doer. That was his nature. He was didn't rely on others. He was he was at work. And while we were at this place, he decided with the toothbrush. That's what I told you. He bought. He was always selling. We never had much money, but always through. In Hashem helped that we knew how to save us. That's the most important thing in life, right? Yeah. Oh, that's true. So he had this idea and he bought all the, bought the toothbrushes and, and there was was hardly any food there. Somehow we managed with bread and rice was and the Red Cross had come also and gave out I don't know, gave out like for the young people blouse for the men black blue boys, young girls like blue shirts. And the girl also like blue shorts and this is because we had nothing, you know, to, to change. Now that's why I'm laughing when my grandchildren could say, Oh, <laughs> soft, I have to take a shower. Yeah. <laughs> you uh, know uh, what uh, I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh <laughs> we couldn't wash well, we couldn't wash. We couldn't wash, we couldn't this, we couldn't do that, I'm telling you. Know. <laughs> I'm laughing many times when they can you oh I must have a you know <laughs> So they gave out shirts which was very good at least we had something to change. Now did I start telling you about the toothbrushes? Did I start telling you this? No. So my father was always doing doing something. So he bought all the toothbrushes. It it we went to this uh, store, whatever it was. And he spoke quite well French, and so so did I. He had learned in Yeshiva French. Did I tell the story? No. Yeah. In which Yeshiva did in he learn? In Hungary. On his own, he learned French. In Hungary. He had only two years of schooling. So one of the Yeshiva Bakhorim went to the Rosh Yeshiva and said, Mendel learned Francais. You understand? So the Rosh, he wanted to tell to tell on Mendel. Mendel was my father. So the Rosh said, "Good, let him, Zola, let him." Let. And he came in very, very handy. And the fact that he, my parents, let us, Rene, myself, and I, learn French in Vienna, now that said we had very little money, was also very, very helpful. And then in Switzerland also that I learned French. So when I, by the time I came to France, I could already quite well converse in French. Eli Kanaus, with your father, where was he born in Hungary? Hungary. Do you know where? In a very small small village. I forgot right now what it was. But he lived in Pucks on the Danube for a while. He went to Yeshiva there. In, in, in Budapest? Hungary. In Hungary. In Hungary. Yeah. And your mother, where was she From born? From Vienna. Your mother's born yeah, in Yeah, she was born in Baden by Wien, which is 20 kilometers, but she grew up in Vienna, yes. In Vienna, all the years, yeah. So tell you what, my father was, I'm not exaggerating, but he was a genius, really. So while we were in front, what he did, he bought all the toothbrushes, did I tell this yeah. to you? What did he do with the toothbrushes? That's what I want to tell you. He worked on it and he wanted to figure something out how to make a rotating toothbrush. So he bought the toothbrushes, few tooth, quite a few toothbrushes, and tried to figure out how to make it rotate. Wow. And he patented, and he did, 
ปัดแม่เหนื่อยเลยแม่เหนื่อยเลยไปสมัคร And this is during the war. He was doing this during the war when you were just arrived in the south of France. And he patented, and he patented, and uh, he had to go to Toulouse to patent it. Patent it. And we had no money and all this. The Papa always had ideas, you know. My mother went along with it. She had no choice, you know. But that is crazy ideas. So I begged the Papa take me along to Toulouse. I never asked for anything. I was sixteen yeah. years old. So the Papa said, "Ellie, we have no money." I said, "Papa, please, 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 please!" And I really never demanded anything. Cause, but I was so persistent. He should take me along. Papa said, "Okay, I'll take you along." Oh, you know, okay, I'll take you along to 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 lose. So well, my father went up to this patent, uh, whatever. Uh, for us, what you call it, office or whatever. I was walking down the street. He didn't, for whatever reason, he didn't want to take me. As I walked down the street and wait for my father, I meet a couple that is from Vienna, and they said, "Good that I meet you. They were neighbors of ours." He said, "We went. We sent our luggage from Belgium to the border, like." So mm-hmm. hundreds of thousands or thousands of people do it, and a bit, bit, we went to look. We were, we went to be in the south of France. We were, we found on the station in Arras, whatever this is called, like a uh, hundred suitcases, and we saw Schlesinger Antwerpen. Wow! And <laughs> saw so a suitcase Schlesinger Antwerpen. It must be you. Must be you. So I couldn't thank the man up, and I assumed it was it was it was ours really. And when the papa went to this patent office and this and this, he told him that they met this Mr. And Mrs. Ginsberg from Vienna. They saw our suitcase in this in this station. I don't know, thirty, forty kilometers. I don't remember whatever fifty kilometers. So it was m i d a s h a m a y you know. So we went the next day, and we found the suitcase that we said we didn't have much. You know, we're poor refugees already from this, and that. but whatever I had a sweater and a skirt and a, some underwear for my mother and for my father. I'm telling you, I'm in a s h a m a y We really was in a s h a m a y We were so 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 thrilled. Now. Then I told you about my father's patent. About f a t So one day after the armistice or whatever. But you stayed in the south of France the whole duration of the war. No, no, only two and a half years. We fled to Switzerland. Oh, uh, then you then you fled to Switzerland. Yeah, we fled to Switzerland. Why did you leave to Switzerland? Why we left? Yeah. To Switzerland. We wanted to get out of France. The France was when, when the France was already invaded. It was invaded. Sure, they deported all the Jews from the France camps. So you how? Did, of course. So how did you manage to get to Switzerland? n e s s i m a n i f l o a d My sister lived in Switzerland. They tell you the s o m e t h i n My sister, we were. But I wanted to tell you what happened. They took all the people from the. Village and they interned them, and you know what happened. What I happened know, it's then? terrible. My father said, "Did I tell it to you? No. We are not going." What do you mean you're not going? He said, "We are. I'm a Hungarian inventor, and you have to treat me like a French inventor. In Hungary, I have special, uh, forgot what you call it, special privileges as a as a Hungarian Fine, yeah. inventor in France." So they said, "Is that so?" Papa said, "We are not going." They said, "Okay, fine. We'll inquire the authorities." We remain the only Jews in this place, not knowing what's going to be where or what. So we stayed there. It was so. One day, the police came over to us and said. We got uh, from the higher authorities whatever 
you have to live, but we don't care where you go. You didn't put us into care. Just get out. We don't care. Just Was this the French police? The French police. I know all French. I'm certain all French. Just, we don't care. Just we have we have to live. We went to Toulouse, and my father knew. Have you heard of the Lublina Raff ever? Mm -hmm. His brother lived in Toulouse. His, this Lublina Raff's name was Rabmeir Shapiro, and this was called, I forgot, also Raff, uh, Mr. Shapiro. My father, knew, my father knew him from Vienna, and he lived in Toulouse. Also fled, but I don't know from where he fled, but he was very brilliant. And Hashem helped, you know. So we heard that this, he lived in Toulouse and that he knows things around, you know, people come to him. He's like sort of settled, he has something that he could stay in Toulouse. So we went to him to Toulouse. But Papa knew him from Vienna just yet. So we came to Toulouse. With a little, ta Papa had a bag with his talus and film, and maybe mm -hmm. two sporem or whatever, and you know, the, the two sporems, and your mama had also loved just, 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 just like that. So came to him, and he said, You know what? Do I tell it too slow? No, 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 no. no. This is amazing. I remember this was 90. Eddie, this is amazing. What year was this? 40. You've already, you've already been in south of France. You were there for, for about six months, for, for five, six, six months. Six yeah, months. yeah. Yeah, probably, yeah, probably, probably, yeah. So this Mr. Shapiro said, well, we'll see what we can do. But it was on a Thursday. He said, now Mr. Schlesinger, did he lived in a house where two Jewish or three Jewish families lived? I don't know what how. Mm. So I said to Mr. Schlesinger, you go up on the first, second floor and they tell him I send you and they let you sleep with Mr. So-and-so in one bed because mm. it was all the good. And Mrs. Schlesinger, whatever, the woman I mean, and I me, mean, we strangers, mm. just say I send you. You know, we had such a high And these were, these were Yiddishes? Y Yiddish, yeah, mm. your Yiddish families, yeah. So the papa slept with Mr. Such and such in the bed and with this and such. And he said, tomorrow morning you come down and we'll, tonight, today, come down and we'll see what we can do. <laughs> he had, so we come down in the morning, come down in the morning and we sit down like in this, whatever, living in, I don't know, no. there was a young guy there. He was 21 years old. He fled from a camp, Berlstrauss, but he was from Hamburg, by the way, I just remember so clearly. Uh, Berlstrauss, he also fled from a camp, but he was just there by Mr. Well, just Shapiro or whatever. No? So Mr. Shapiro said to him, listen, Berlstrauss, you live, I know where you live, in this and this village. Now, you, there I heard is a good mayor, because you need, yeah, we had to be legal, we had no money. Mm -hmm. We needed food coupons, without bread you can't live. Yeah. I mean nowadays you could live without bread because you can have this and cakes and this, but those days, you know that, yeah. he said, so he said, you wear a strauss, you take the Schlesingers along, you drop them off there and there, and there's a good mayor, and then and, and, and see my daughter. Yeah, but here they can stay. So Bell Strauss said, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. He said, if I tell you, you do, 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 do this, yet, such and so. So we had to go with the train. We were very lucky. I'll never forget this. We had Hungarian passports made out in Vichy. Of oh, course, that later. No, no, it was that. I don't know, Papa had brilliant ideas. I still have it to this very day, so it, it's a masterpiece. 
Minasomai made out in Vishyang, yeah, 1941. I can't begin to tell you. Father was, my father was very good. <coughs> So we went. <coughs> I just have to take yeah. a drink of water just tomorrow, please. Strauss, he takes you to the village. Um. We calmed down, yes, she was afraid. We walked, had a walk seven kilometers. For my mother was very difficult. <coughs> My father was very fit. My mother also, but I felt such a rachmonis with her. I had such pity on her. Because she, she was a rachmonis, not a papa, not a, you know? I felt so sorry for her. So we finally got to this village. And we got, yeah, we got to this village. And we stopped off at the first it was like a farmhouse, and that was her first, her first house. And it was, I don't know if you're a well-known family, the name was Halberstam. They were from Vienna. He, he, Mrs. Halberstam was the daughter of the Altstädter Hof. I don't know if it says something, it was somebody really. Mm -hmm. So we stopped off in there, and he dropped us off there. But he was so afraid, but he had such fear or respect of this. Of the road. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Rav Shapiro. Yeah, Rav, yeah, of Mr., Mr., yeah, Mr. Shapiro. No, it was not Rav, it was his brother. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Shapiro, yeah, he had such fear of him, yeah. So he dropped us off there and he was only happy to get rid of us. So we came in here and there was this man, the family Halberstam from Vienna, and they lived in a house that I've never seen. Mushrooms were growing on the wall. That's how humid it was. The, the floor was sand. And this missus had just come home from the hospital. She just had a, a cancer operation. She just came home from the hospital. And they had three boys and one girl. So Papa said, to, 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 my father said, the first thing what we're going to do when we get a little bit sad, we're going to help them that she can't live. And she just came home from the hospital again in this, in this, uh, not stone floor, what did I say, sand, sand. sand. It was terrible. So sure enough, so, so he, Mr. Halberstam said, you know, here, you can't stay here, but three kilometers away is a very, the Lips family, Werner, we knew them, an old couple. They were 62 years old, an old couple. <laughs> Those days with 62, you were old, you know. Down there with 62, you go flying here and there, yeah. And they have a very good mayor, and you'll be able to settle there somehow. We had to be legal because we needed food components. Mm -hmm. We had no man. So we went to the Werners, and the first thing, the way they lived was just not to be told. Just, I can't tell you how primitive. So my father decided to do said, Once we're going to get settled somehow, if we can stay here, mm -hmm. the first thing is we're going to get them out, the, 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 get them a more decent place to, to live. It was just unbelievable. So we went to the mayor with Mrs. Werner, and I spoke, and I said, this is my tante, and they can't speak in French at all. And we came to help them, can we stay here? But we had to be legal, because we needed yeah. Foucault. Mm -hmm. So the mayor said, I make pleasure, mademoiselle, with pleasure. With pleasure. And, and the mayor knew you were Jewish? No, yeah, yeah. Uh. He said, I beg please, yeah, man, but we said, yeah, yeah, yeah. The mayor, yeah, I knew it was Jewish. The thing we had to be legal because they said, of, because yeah. of the food, of the food components. So, finally, we found a, don't ask how we, we found, we found a room. The mama, the papa, and I, we slept together in a double bed, the three of us.
Did you hear what I said? And the three of you in a double date. Well. <laughs> of course, I had my pajamas and my toothbrush and my uh, my makeup to take <laughs> off. And <laughs> you slept the three of us. But we slept in a room where another three families had to walk through because there were another family who had one room and another family had two, also two families in one room and another. So the mama, the papa and I, we slept in this in this room. In this room. So we decided we were only too happy. Believe me, believe me. I took off my makeup <laughs> and my dress. And, uh, you know, my mother with a fancy nightgown. <laughs> so, but we, we, we went to the next we, we went to the, we were standing outside. It was like a, like this, what should I say? There was one house here, and the other one house was, I don't know, 200 meters away, and the other 300 meters away. So, we were standing on the corner the next day, Time to look where we could. It was no doctor's. I mean, too good, too fast to live in this place. And then finally, we found her. We were standing on the corner. There was ca coming a, a woman with a, with a horse and a buggy, and she looked like she was 90 years old. She had no teeth. So the papa asked her. So maybe she would have a room to rent, first of all. So she says, you know, so the papa said to her, your friend sounds like you are from the north, you know, the, because the, the southern speak with, like in America, mm -hmm. was with the southern accent. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so, so the papa said to her, well, your friend sounds like you are from Oh, she said, you see, this is this we kilometer. She says, I'm from 18 kilometers from Paris. Well, the way the papa said to her French sounded, she gave us a room. <laughs> the way the papa complimented her, she looked like she was 42 years old. She looked like 85. Old. I mean, without teeth, without, you know. So she gave us a room. She was a tzaddika. She gave us a room. She let us say because the papa didn't know what to say to her. That that did it. Did she ever find out that you were Jewish? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it didn't, didn't make a difference. No, 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 no it didn't make a difference. So, no, no, no. As a matter of fact, she was very, very good to us. She let us do, you know, make a hole in the wall. For the for the steam to go out from the cooking and this it was very very good to us because the papa uh, gave a compliment. Just we did you this this kilometer of Paris? And she said, "I'm from 18 kilometers of her." She looked like 85, or like 95. Wow. I'm telling you, but that did that it did it that company. So we were able to stay for two years. And Eddie can ask during this time, were yeah. there any Germans that came into the village? None. You never saw a German soldier coming in, or no, because the Germans weren't just they, they, we were in a Vichy France. It was run by the Germans, but they, but they gave were like a. Yeah, but in the city there were, you know. Yeah. But yeah. the Vichy government deported you know, the no, Jews. Sure, yeah. sure, 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 you know. But I went, tell you what, I would say all the credit to my father because he was such a smart man. And her same helped us a lot, you know. So what you he stayed was with this lady for two years? For two years we stayed, at, yes. And what did you do during this time? Did you. I. The first of my father was writing a book. And my mother was typing all the time. My father was writing, my mother was typing. But my parents were special, special people. They helped a lot of people. And what I, what I tell you is my father's credit, or my parents' credit. My father sent me to the highest officials but first of all, the thing was, all the Jews had to go to a camp. 
you know about that, of yeah. course, yeah. So my father, once you're in a camp, forget it, you know. My father was a duo, was a duo, was a duo. He didn't sit just as I said. When they, the police came to us on Friday and they said that Papa has to go on Monday to camp. We, we didn't know about Auschwitz at the time, but we knew once you go to a camp you don't, you don't come out. So uh, Papa. I was 16, 17 at the time, but from 16 to 18 in France. So, just a second. So, Papa sent me. They came to us on Friday, the police said, but by, by, by Monday, my husband is, my father has to go. So, my father sent me on Saturday morning, Shabbat morning to the city, to Montauban. Have you heard of the city of Montauban? It's in the south of France. That's the capital of tarn garonne That's the name mm. of the state. Not far from Toulouse, about 30, 40 kilometers. Sent me that I should go and try. There's a Jewish family. The family was called, was called Lerna. They lived in Montauban, and they lived, they were from Antwerpen, and the Mr. Lerner was a shocker. Not in France, or whatever, there was a shocker. And they had a very open house. And in that, they were very friendly with a young rabbi, his name was, he was from Vienna, and his name was Rabbi, rabbi Kallenberg, he was a marriage. And he was always coming there to, to the learners. They had a very open house. And this, this Rabbi Kallenberg was a very smart man. And he had a very brilliant guy, actually. He wasn't married yet. And so my father sent me that Shabbat morning. I went in the train on Saturday morning to this family learner. And the Papa wanted me to try to do what he can, what I can do, that he shouldn't have to go to the camp. So I went to the family learner, and this Rabina Kallenberg was there, and I was very, very upset. And I said, I don't know what I should do, what, 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 and that my father wants to go to a camp. We didn't know about us, we know they wouldn't come out. Anyway. So this Rabina Kallenberg said to me, no. It's only now, like 11 o'clock or 10.30 mm -hmm. in the morning, I left very, very early with the train. He said, I, I can tell you what you can do. Try. In a prefecture, which is the head, you know what a prefecture is? Yeah. The top government, the government. There are two governments there. One was one was the prefecture and the one, I forgot what it was, I forgot right now what this other one, two top, top government. There is this Mr. So-and-so, his name is Mr. Flugfelder. He's a very brutal guy, a terrible, terrible guy. And he is in charge of the Jews in this whole state of, in the state. And there's another Mr. who is the vice for this president, forgot what you call governor, vice governor from the state. From the state, his name is Monsieur Soriak. If you go, can go to Monsieur Soriak, you find favor in his eyes. Maybe, maybe you know, as a young girl, yes. uh, maybe he will give you a note that your father doesn't. These are the only two people that eventually. So I rushed myself out, rushed, 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 Shabbos morning, you know, and and I go to the office of Monsieur Soriak. No, Monsieur Flugfelder. Monsieur Fl the name Flugfelder is already such a yeah. horrible name, I don't have to tell you. He was the most feared person in the state. What do I have to do? What can he do to me? He can keep me there. 
you know, but I had to have the courage. My father gave me that courage. And I was very shy by nature. So I came to Monsieur Flugfelder and I started. It was close, getting almost 11.30 at 12 o'clock. So I come in and I started crying. And this miserable true hater, whatever he was, had pity on me. He had pity on me. T.G. Hoover said, I said to him, my father has to go to this camp and he's so weak. And then I said, well, he said to me, he has to go. <laughs> what <I'm doing." laughs> Okay, you yeah. went to see. He opened up his drawer and I saw a gun in it. I wasn't afraid he was going to do anything to me, really not. And I begged him, I said, my father has to go to this camp, he has to go tomorrow, please, please, please help me. So he said, I promise you, your father has, he has to go to camp, to this camp. There's nothing in the world I can do for you. However, I promise you that within three weeks he will come home. And I started crying. He said, I promise you, this is a serious promise. So I had no choice, but I had to leave. Then I went in to Monsieur Soriak. He was the vice um, governor of the state of where to lose was it called Haute Garonne. And I went in, I don't know how in the world I did it, but I went into him. It was shortly before 12 o'clock also. And I was afraid they were very close to the office. And I started begging him he should do this. He saw it. Also, I don't know what happened, but he did promise. I told he said, your father must go to the camp, but I promise you that he will go out. I will sign it for you. That, not for you now, but he will get out. So I had no choice but to leave. I said, really, really, you promise? I mean, what did I know what his promise is, you know? And I left. And I went home, and my parents were terribly, terribly upset. They had hoped in all possibility that I might be able to do something for him. I mean, they would hope. But I said, Papa, Mama, this man, these two men promised me that within three weeks of Papa, he has to go, within three weeks of Papa will get out. Oh, you couldn't do I said, it, this is the most I could, this is not possible to even get to them. With all, all, I don't know, by might, with all protection or whatever you call it, was able to go to them. Okay, so my father had to go to this camp. And I went to visit him and I saw to my horror the way it looked there. The camp was called Setfung. And it was, I forgot exactly where it was, about an hour or so, an hour and a half or something from us. I was devastated from what I saw. We, later on, they said all the, all the inmates were sent down to Auschwitz. So, three weeks later, my father came in. and there's no way how I could say how I thank these people and how grateful we were. They kept the word. They kept, the both of them kept their word. Now, I had a neighbor from a different village. Oh, I forgot whatever, excuse me now. Now my father had sent me to this, back to them, to the post to Monsieur Flugfelder and to Monsieur Soyak. There was a terrible fam famine in the country and uh, everything was rationed, but things that were rationed on the ration card were just not available in the stores. 
so people really were very, 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 very worked up around, were very hungry. And since we lived in the country, I had connections with the farmers, and they were very, very kind to me. And I had some farmers that were selling me eggs. One, one especially, he lived very, very high up on a hill. And Monsieur Ali Bern had a very vicious dog. Fortunately, I wasn't afraid of the dogs. Fortunately, because he let me come to his uh, farm only late at night when it was dark, which was quite late at night because in France at that time during the war they had two hours uh, summer time, whatever it was, I forgot what you call this. Uh, yes. And he gave me he gave me the eggs, and I was always very very happy. So my father decided what I should do. Out of out of gratefulness or whatever we call, I should bring some eggs to Monsieur Soriak and to Monsieur Flugfelder. They were not. It was on a. You couldn't get it. It was on black market. I don't know if it was available altogether. And my father packed it, packed it so so well. These eggs into an old sweater that they shouldn't touch each other. And I carried it in my school bag that I had still from Vienna. And I went in to the office to Monsieur to Monsieur Flugfelder and wanted to bring because he was it, he was in charge of the state for black market, the Jews and something else, I don't know what. Uh, so, but a bit of early study, there was nothing available. So he told me first, first he said to me, put it in my drawer, in his, in his desk drawer. That's when I saw the gun in his desk drawer. But then he said to me, you know what, Mademoiselle, Miss, I live on six plus, plus four, which wasn't very far from the prefecture. Bring it to my wife. Come to my house and bring it to my wife. Did I tell you my father came home? Did I tell this to you already? So I did this and I brought it to Monsieur Flugfelder's home and brought it to his wife. And she was ever so grateful. She was ever so grateful to me and to Monsieur Soriak. He lived very far, but I was always riding on a bicycle. I had a boy's bicycle, and in those days you could take the, the train. There was a special uh, compartment for bicycles because that was basically the only trans form of trans private transportations because there were hardly any buses or trains or so. So when I was very lucky because I had a boy's bicycle. I'm just mentioning this. So he asked me also to take it out. So I had to go to Monsieur Soriak, who lived quite far, with my bicycle and with 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 the uh, with the eggs, and I brought it and brought it to his house. So I had favors in their eyes. They said to let my father be, but I tell it to you already. Yes. So I had a neighbor and a friend, a very good friend, Miss Mister Mrs. I forgot right now what her name is. One minute, and we know them from Vienna. Right now, at the moment, it has escaped my name. She, after my father came home, Mrs. Lichter, Lichter, they lived in the next village. After my father came, her her husband was her husband was also interned in the same family. She comes to me and she begged me, begged me, begged me. I should do something for her husband to try to get him out also of the camp. Basically, I was a very shy person, uh, so it took a special, extra special effort for me to speak up and to go to these people, to go and to do and to ask. But she came to me and she begged me, her husband was also in this camp, said for if I should do it for her. It was all on a Saturday morning. She came over to me, also he has to go. So. I went with her, and he was already, he was already, that's what it was, he was already in this camp. And she came and she cried to me. So my father said, I should go, 
So I spun. Yeah, and also Saturday night was always the same. Was always, yeah, she was a very religious woman. She was a teacher. She was from Hamburg. And so also again it was on a Saturday morning. We had to go by train. And she begged me, begged me I should go. My father sent me. And she was down near the prefecture was a park. And she was there and prayed with her prayer book. She was very religious. While I while I went while I went up to this. But as I said, basically I was very shy, so it took a tremendous amount of effort on my part to speak up and to go. I'm not a pushy person by nature. I'm rather a very, very shy person. But I had no choice but, but do certain things against my better against my nature, I would say. So I went up to this office and begged him to back to Monsieur Flugfelder also. He got quite annoyed with me, but he said, Okay, okay, but don't ask ever, ever anything anymore from me because I really, 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 really can't do it. So I said, You know, thank you so much, so much. I appreciate this. May God bless you. Whatever I said, something like that. And then I went up to the Monsieur, Monsieur Soriak. And as I said again, I was a very shy person by nature, so it took a tremendous, tremendous effort on my part to speak up to these high officials. Who knows what they're going to I really wasn't afraid they're going to do something to me. That's, that's really the... But they could have. They could have. So I begged Monsieur Soriak also, please, please, please. He said, I signed already. He can't get out. I signed it already, Lucy. I said, I beg you, please, Monsieur, sir, please, you're such a kind man. I don't remember what I, I pleaded with him. He said, okay, I'm going to let him out. Wow. So, but I didn't know if he was going to keep his word. You know, we have to see this, we have to see that. And I think a few days later, or a week, a week, a week later, Mrs. Lister, walked over those seven kilometers where she lived. She said, Ellie, I have to tell you. I got very emotional when I just said, my husband came out of the camp. So she didn't know how to pay me, how to be out of gratitude, what she should do for me. There was nothing they could do really except say thank you. And I had to thank my parents. So she brought me a book that was written by Rabbi Sam Sol, Sam Sol Raphael Hirsch from Frankfurt. And it was called The Choref. And she brought me this book that she had brought from, from Vienna to this, to, to Belgium and then from Japan. That was her treasure, treasure, treasure. And that, out of gratitude to me, she gave, she gave me this book, which was for her a very, very part of her, her, her life. Out of gratitude, she gave it to me. So Mr. Lister came out. Fortunately, before the war, war before, before Pearl Harbor, before. The Americans went into the into the war with Germany. They were able they got some visas to go to to America, and they were able they to survived. establish yes yes a whole family. So you actually saved his life. Yeah. Your yeah, actions yeah. and your father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Encouraging you to. Yes, yeah. Mila Shemaim, you you yeah. actually saved yeah, his yeah, life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. So that's the story. What and, else should I And tell how you? long did you stay in the south of France? We st oh, that is now also something. Yeah. Did, did, T did you tell them the Simcha story? No, did oh, I tell it? No. Did you tell no, them? No, I, no I, you have to tell them the story. Tell them how, uh, all, all together, that, that you were on the train with them and then the child's got pneumonia, was in the hospital. Oh, well. And how they fled. Oh, I don't can tell you, okay. This this is the the highlight. And then did you tell him the Harry story? 
No. Why? But I can't keep it for 16 no, hours. My mother has two amazing, amazing okay. stories. Okay. Oh, yeah. And no. they would be amazing. amazing no, they okay, I'll tell him. I'll tell him the same first. Like, how did they go to the same Simple story. story. They were on the train with you. They were on the same, in the same cabin on the train with you for six days from Belgium to... To the, the south of France. Boys. They became very... When you were on the train? Yeah, with these with people. We became very, very friendly with them. I told you, I did not. Mm -hmm. With the family, if they were from Dusseldorf. You know, from Dusseldorf. We became. Dusseldorf. How does the story go? I forgot. So and they it's came, a major story. They showed story. up in your village one day. They had fled from an internment camp. Yeah. yeah. Remember, yeah. remember the son, got, the older son got pneumonia and he was in a hospital and they were in the internment yeah, camp. Yeah, yeah. So we met befriended these people and then the train. And then they, they stayed in the, the same village with us and then they had to leave to go to a camp. I told you we didn't go because yeah. my father met this pet and we said we are not, we are not going. So, so we were all in this little tiny, tiny village with this. Oh yeah, I forgot about it. That's a major story, really. One day, a couple comes to us on a Shabbos morning. I forgot what it was. That we fled together. We befriended them in the train. Since we were all these days in the train, we became very friendly. Had two boys, and they came. They came to us. They heard some place, they fled from a camp and they were in Montauban and they heard the slazing us, which were us, had connections with the police, yes, so that was us, that was, that was us. And they came on a Shabbos morning with a boy. With a boy, no, they came with two boys. boys. They came with the two boys, the one who had pneumonia and with Simcha. I'll make a long story short. They said they heard that the Schlesingers have connections with the police and they'll be able to, you know, to, to stay. So we had only one room, my parents and I, we slept in, we stayed in one room. So when these people came, we put them quickly into the barn, into the barn. For it wasn't our house. You know, we lived in this in this farmhouse because we were afraid ourselves. Um, him as we as good as is. Okay. Oh yeah. Hello, my name is Hadassah Esther Auerbach, and I am Mrs. Brown's daughter. And I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction. Um, my mother was, and her parents were on um, the train together with a family. Uh, of a mother and a father and two young boys. I think one was about nine and one was 11 or seven mm -hmm. and nine. Yeah, yeah, and they yeah. were originally from Dusseldorf. And I think they also had come from Vienna. Yeah, no, 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 not from Vienna. Belgium. And then from they were Belgium, on the train from, from Belgium. Belgium. They were fleeing to France. And they were on the train from Monday until the following Saturday night. And they ended up in the same village and um, Unfortunately, they came and took this family away to an internment camp. And what happens is that after a while, the older son, who was a little boy, developed pneumonia. And uh, he was put into a, a local hospital. And the French who were running the internment camp allowed the parents to visit their child once a week. There were obviously no antibiotics at the time and it was a long period of time that the child was in the hospital. And once a week the parents were permitted to visit him but not the younger child. They left the younger child in the camp as a hostage. And uh, this went on week after week and one day the younger child had an idea and said to his father, Papa, why don't I escape and climb over the fence or under the fence while you are at the hospital and let's run away with my big brother. The father was so shocked that the child would dare to express an idea and suggest an idea on his own when children were seen and not heard in those days that he slapped him across the face. 
when he suggested that. Or maybe he thought it was too dangerous or something might happen. Oh, sure, yeah. He said that he thinks his father was shocked that he would just speak up because he wasn't accustomed to being to doing that. That was his interpretation. Um, to nevertheless, a week later, the father um, approached him and said, we are going to the hospital today to visit your older brother and we want you to climb over the fence or under the fence and meet us at such and such a time, um, at such and such a place. We're going to smuggle your brother out of the hospital and we are going to run away. And that's what happened. They ran away. They were refugees. They literally, literally had the clothes on their bodies and nothing else. And they ran away and they fled. And they fled to the nearby town where there was a Jewish family who lived there. And they said, what should we do? We are with our clothes on our backs and nothing more, with no papers. Where should we go? And he knew that my mother had connections with the police and with the mayor of the town and that she might be able to help them. He sent them to the Schlesingers, which, and they knew, they knew my mother and her parents because they had been on the train with them. And they showed up on Shabbos. And my, my grandparents and my mother were living in one room and could not obviously share the room with an extra four people. Um, but my mother went to the mayor of the town. My mother was a beautiful girl who had tremendous chen. Hashem put her chen into people's eyes, which is a nes. Um, the thing is that nobody could survive without, um, without food food stamp, it wasn't food stamps, but it was food. Like a ration, there was ration. Yeah, ration cards. Um, nobody could survive without bread rations. You had to have that to survive. So my mother went to the mayor and she gave a story that they came from Lyon, they needed to be in the country because they had a child who wasn't well. And that's why they came there. They need to be in the countryside with fresh air. And um, could he possibly give them food rations, food cards. And he said to my mother, if you can find a place for them to live, I will be happy to give the food coupons to you. So my mother said, I will take responsibility to find them a place to live. And he gave them, he gave my mother four coupons for the four family members. And my mother found them, I guess with the help of my grandfather, a place to live in the next village, a hovel, a, a barn, it was in a barn but that's where they lived. And they lived there for, I think, a year, a year and yeah, a half? A few months. A few months. A couple of months, for a while. Go uh, on. For a while. They it subsequently sent their older son, who was about 11, to um, Mossack. It was about 50 kilometers away. There was a children's home. It was pretending to be a French orphanage, but in reality, it was a Jewish couple, not religious at all, but they were Jewish tzaddikim. They took in all these Jewish refugee wow. children and pretended that they were French orphans. And the children were not allowed to speak any German, only French, and they took care of them. And the older child was sent there, and they were living there with the younger child. And um, one day, and it was Friday afternoon, one of the policemen came over to my mother. My mother lived outside the village, but she was in the village on Friday afternoon. And one of the policemen came over and said, Mademoiselle Ellie, we found out the truth. You told us that they came from Lyon, but we found out that they came from, um, escaped. from they escaped from a camp, from an internment camp. From, by the way, from the internment camp, they, uh, they sent them all to Auschwitz and murdered them. That was the first step. And um, we are coming tonight to deport them, to, to pick them up. And this was the French? This, this was the French, French police, police in the, in the village. Afternoon. So my mother said, no, no, that's not true. They came from Lyon. And the policeman said to my mother, no, no, we know that you lied. We know the truth. We are coming tonight. So my mother was shaken. She lived uh, about a kilometer outside the village. She came home and she said to her father, Papa, they found out. What should I do? And her father told her, Mommy, you can really continue. No, continue. They told her to um, take her bike. I had a boy's bike. My mother had a boy's bike. Take her bike and go to the next village. And as far as I remember, 
the people knew that my mother didn't use her bike on Shabbos, so she has to sort of hide to get outside the village because she did because it was Shabbos. And she sneaked out of the village and then rode to the next village and told the parents just to run away, just to flee. Unfortunately, the parents were caught and they were they were the deported court. and they were mur murdered. But she took this young child who was about 11, uh, who was about nine, the younger one, and she took him on her bike. She had a boy's bike. She took him on her bike a couple of kilometers to the train station. How many kilometers was it? About five. She about five, six kilometers on the train Friday station. Night. Friday night. It was Shabbos. And she took him with her to the train station. And she found the train to Mossack. And she took him with her bicycle on the train to I had to, to go Mossack. to the restaurant Friday night. Because she was afraid there so were many um, officers and Nazis at the train station. So she went into the restaurant with the boy and they ordered a drink or something so that they wouldn't look suspicious. And then they got on the train and they arrived in Mossack and they found out where this children's home was. And they got to the children's home. And my mother brought him in and said, would you keep this child? He had a brother there. He told us that... When he saw his brother, they hugged. They could not communicate because he didn't know a word of French, only German. And the brother, they were not. They were told that you are not allowed to speak a word oh, of German. German here. So they just hugged, but they could not communicate. Then the the guy who ran the place said to him, "What's your name?" He said, "My name is Simcha." And he said, "Oh no no no! What is your non-Jewish name?" And he said, "My name is Fred." He says, we already have a Fred here. You'll be Freddy. So he says, so I became Freddy. And my mother asked if she could remain there um, until after Shabbos because... Till Sunday. Till Sunday. Because it was a mitzvah. She was allowed to go there on Shabbos to save this child's life. But now the child was there. It's not Pikuach Nefesh anymore. So she only got back home on Sunday. And when she got back home, her parents were not there. And my mother was afraid that they were taken by the police. Now you continue, Mom? Yeah. No, continue, then I'll so continue. She, um, no, but my parents came back, so I asked the landlady, but I, was there any police here? She said, no, nobody was over there. Was here. So I was here, so finally my parents came back. Monday morning, at 8 o'clock in the morning, I, I was uh, the, the the dog started barking something terrible. So I said to my parents, uh-uh, that's the police for me. I have no doubt about it. That was the police. It really came. So there were three policemen. And one was the one, we, they came all the way to bicycles. That was a form of transportation. So they came. And it was also that policeman was there, the one that told me about that the, the people will be rearrested. The know. one who warned yeah, my mother. Who warned my mother, who warned me. So he wasn't allowed to tell me and I wasn't allowed to, to know. So he, whatever they interrogated me, interrogated, and he knew I was lying. So we really had a very big secret, secret yes. amongst the monks. It's a, yeah, that's been easier. Excuse me. I had a very big secret. So they asked me to come down to the police station. Yes. And he said, take along a sandwich, take along some bread, and us, and us, you're going to be at the, the police. Police was about four kilometers away from where I was. I knew I wasn't going to say. But the policeman also who interrogated me was also the one who knew my own room was sick. It was just before Yom Kippur, 1942. So finally, finally, all day long, they, they threatened, they interrogated me, threatened and threatened. But this, I had a secret with this policeman, you know? This, 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 I know he wasn't allowed to tell me and I wasn't allowed to say this. So he knew all along I was like, eventually they let me go. Eventually. Yeah, eventually they let me go. When I came home, then I was very upset. My parents weren't home. But they came home, they went to the other village. It was also a friend. I don't know, it was a terrible situation. But uh, so 
Now the story goes that did I tell you now 61 years no. later? Okay. Now we sit in, 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 in uh, France, we fled then to Switzerland in September 1942. We slept, we went to Switzerland, fled to Switzerland. I was always thinking, who knows what happened to this boy, maybe I brought him to his death. Because I heard, while I was in, I heard that the whole uh, group of people were deported, so I felt oh, very terrible, maybe I brought him to his death. You never know, but of course I tried to do what I could do under the circumstances, it was just the right thing. But nevertheless, and still my conscience really bothered me quite a bit. And I was thinking of him, and I was thinking quite often about him. Although I knew I did the right thing, but nevertheless to know that I would have done such a thing was a terrible burden for me. So then we fled to Switzerland, I got married, we went to America, just a second. So during the rest of the war you spent in Switzerland? The rest of the war spent in Switzerland. And where in Switzerland and did I you go? And I got married, fun. Where in Switzerland? First of all I was interned in a camp in Switzerland, then I was freed, I was in Lucerne. And Lucerne. were you with your parents in the camp? Uh, my mother and I, we were in one camp, yes, in Oxford, and my father was in a different camp, it was called Buren on the Aare. Eddie, can I just ask, yes, was sure. it very difficult for you to flee to Switzerland? Because Switzerland... To flee to Switzerland, to yes, of and, course. And into Switzerland? Of course, illegally, it was so very difficult. How did you get into Switzerland? Well, we get, had to go at night over the mountain, it was very... From, First of all, the most difficult part, I think, was the trip from uh, from the village, from the, and then we had to get into Toulouse, into to the border of France. That was the most worrisome thing, because they took, police was all over, they took, they took people off the train. But we have a very fortunate, we had an Hungarian passport, who was made out in Vichy, and in 1941, which was very, I may have mentioned it, it was the yeah. most unusual thing. My father had this brilliant idea. I guess it may have been the only passports that have been made out and produced. In, in, in Vichy, in the Hungarian France. part, wow. yeah. yeah. I still have it to this, to this very day. Uh, I mean, I have it as a, as a, as a souvenir. But I don't know where was it. We fled into and, France. And then, how did you get from the French border into Switzerland? That was a major thing. Yeah, we had to. It was not such an easy thing. We found. We went first. We we, we went to to the border to Anmas, and which was the border, border, the border town. I spoke very well French, which was very helpful. We rented a room on the border, in the border town, just a second. And we, did, we decided that my father and I, we would try to find out where exactly the border is and where we might go, where we might go illegal at, illegally at night. And we took a train, or oh, bus, no bus, excuse me. My, fa my mother stayed at the hotel, the hotel room, and uh, my father and I, while we were looking around, we went by bus to, to, to look how, where, where, where we might be able to cross the border. And all of a sudden, the bus stopped. And we were in Switzerland. The bus went into Switzerland? Yes. This bus went straight to Switzerland without stopping at a port. Yeah. But we had my mother stayed in at the hotel. My mother stayed at the place in Anmas. In, in, in France. In France. Can you imagine we had to go back? To, to, if my mother had been with us, we would have been saved in Switzerland. So we had to go back, the Papa and I, and we went back, and then finally, finally, we had to join a group because uh, join a group that went at night 
where about ten people went at night and to Switzerland. You couldn't take the bus again? Pardon? You didn't, you, there was no possibility you could take the bus N again? No, we were afraid because there was always police oh, and okay. this and that. They were searching for refugees and this. No, we were afraid. No, this was just... Can you imagine we were in Switzerland, my mother stayed, my brother left. So what happened? Then we finally, in Switzerland, we found somebody who had... Do you remember crossing at night? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Were sure. you nervous, was it? Nervous. Rex, nervous Rex, yeah, we were. I'm sure. Nervous Rex. The problem was, at that time, my sister lived in Switzerland. And she kept on writing, come, and then she said, don't come, they sent the people back. There was no, we had no telephone that you could call or so, so it was very difficult. So by the time, so we went to Geneva. You managed to get through and... Not to Geneva, but I'm talking to Anmas, to the border, to the to border. The border, town, and to the border. it was night time and you night crossed time. the border? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the problem was, so we had to pay, we were going to, we were, have, would have to pay the, the leader that we, there were about 10 people, yes. They were assembled okay. in, somebody had a, assembled in Anmas, that's a border town in Switzerland, yeah. And we were going to in the middle of the night. And as we went very, very quietly, my mother got a coughing spell from the Aye. nerves, from the, the no doubt, it don't know. So. And one minute later, a huge dog comes, Aye. and the police screaming with a flashlight. Stop or I shoot. I'll never in French. Stop or I shoot. So we did. So we stopped. All was a group of people. We didn't know was it a Swiss policeman or, or a French. French because they speak French. And it. So till we finally saw it was a Swiss. So we threw ourselves on the ground and said, please, please let us let. You know, we were so, so frantic. We were so frantic. So he said, I should open in French, I have to do my duty, I have to do... So we didn't know what he meant was his duty. If he has to send us back, you know, those few minutes were so terrible, ter but he was a Swiss uh, officer and he took us then to a Swiss police station which in Switzerland. So once we were in Switzerland, we had hope now we'll be able, we'll be safe. And sure enough, we were, we really were safe. They interrogated us about the guide, you know, and this and this and this. We didn't want to give away his name either. And finally, they took us to an internment camp near Geneva. So they didn't, thank God, they didn't uh, deport you back to France? We didn't, know because... But there were many cases yeah, where no, Jews had crossed we, we, and they we, were we, deported we, back, we, many we, cases. We, we, know, we know that, we know that. We At this time, can I ask you, have, yeah. uh, did you ever hear about Rekha Sternbuch? Pardon? Did you, no, had nothing to do with but her. But did you ever, did you know that who she was? Or? Yeah, yeah, Rekha Sternburg. But did yeah. you know at this time that there was no, a lady called... No, no, no. Because we were independent completely. And you didn't know about no, her at this no, time? No, 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 because my sister wrote us. Now, come. My sister lived in Zurich. She wrote us into, in a, forgot what you call it, that nobody else knew this uh, kind of... Like a type of code? Yeah, Nicole, Betty York, that this is now we, should, we could come. Wow. That's what it was. So we finally came, yeah. And you were in Turban Camp near Geneva? Yeah, near Geneva, near Geneva, the Colonel Camp near Geneva, like a few kilometers from Geneva, from Geneva. It was called Camp Varambe. It's talking about Switzerland, if we fled to Switzerland. Oh, oh, you, oh. I, was I thought one of you still talking about Simcha. No, we will, uh, when your mom got married. We oh. still, and how long were you in internment camp in, in uh, oh, near Geneva? So Not long. I tell you what, I was very lucky. Because we were, I forgot already, it was, my father was a doer, always. I told you which, yeah. yeah. So while we were in Geneva in, the, in this, this camp, the papa was able to arrange forgot to get 
forgot to tell this one. Oh, no, 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 we were freed. Now, we were, uh, I think there were 10 days or something, there was no kosher food. There was no kosher food. So we managed, we ate porridge. Or, uh, or so. so we 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 got freed. We got freed. I don't know how come. Because Maybe because you had the Hungarian passports? I forgot why we got released. Oh, they, people kept coming, kept coming. Because we had been in Switzerland already before, mm -hmm. so this somehow we were released. So we were from the camp in Geneva, around base, we were in Geneva. And then did you get to meet your sister? Who was in yeah, my sister came, yeah. She came, yes, 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 that's right, she came, yes. And her. how long hadn't you seen your sister? No, not so long. I haven't seen her maybe a year and a half. Oh, no, we were two years and two and a half years in France, about four years or something. Wow, and your parents? Well, I was together with my parents. But they hadn't seen, hadn't the seen her either, no, no. So the reunion must have been incredibly my emotional. My was some woman, unusual person, too many. She was a very unusual, she was a very courageous woman, courageous person herself. She was very intelligent, very courageous. She was a very special, she, she was a special woman, really, yeah, yeah. And Ellie, do you remember, you must remember when you met, when you were reunited? She walked with us, oh no, that was when we were in another internment camp. Now first thing, she came, when, fuck out, she came to Geneva to this camp and was allowed to go out because she spoke well French and Switzerland and this and that. They let me go out of this camp. They let me go out for a few of a couple of hours, but my parents were the hostages, so to say. And then, then, then they came. And then we were freed. Then we were freed. And my father, as I said, he was a dwarf, so he was arranging. We were free to Geneva. And he made sure there was in, a, in Geneva, in a Jewish. You're looking for Russia? Maybe she's she's in there. She's she's in her room. Is that my telephone or yours? It's mine. I gave you mine. So my sister what is she came? She came to the internment camp. Yeah, she came to the internment camp, yeah. With the gotcha, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she was already she was married? Yeah. Did she have any children yeah, by this time? Yeah, she had already a baby that we haven't oh, seen yet. So the first grandchild? Yeah, the first grandchild. It must have been um, incredibly she emotional. She, she was a special person. And how long did you stay in Switzerland? I spent time from 42 to 46. In 44 I got married in Switzerland to my guy. I was married 61 years, and 60 years were bliss. You know what that means? 60 years were bliss. And your, your husband, you met, he was he, from where did he come from? Also from Vienna, from the same neighborhood, from the same school, from the same school. He was six years older than I, more than six years older. Yes, I would be very, very, very lucky, we were very, very, very happy. Very, very, but of course I told you, he was money crazy, so he married me for my money. He you had such a sense of humor. But <laughs> he didn't even deny it. I had 40 Swiss Hello? francs, 40 Swiss francs in my pocket. And I said, I know why you married me, because you're money crazy. He didn't deny it. He said, that's the way I am, that's my nature. I'm just a money crazy guy, that's all there is to it. And we, you lived in, in, in Switzerland? Yeah. For First, my husband had a job in Davos, yeah. in a Jewish sanatorium. It was called Etania. And he really had two brothers in Colombia, in Barranquilla. One had died, but he wanted to go 
after the war to Barranquilla too. So he learned for him, the brothers were not religious and not observant and not good. So he wanted to learn for himself to shecht chickens and so because he was very religious and he couldn't eat there at his brother. And because he had learned that, he was able to get a job in Switzerland in the Davos because he also he was a husband and he was so hurt for himself, he learned it, yes, and that's why he was able to get a job in Davos as he got it as a sort of manager of the uh, sanatorium, it was called Etania, but as a Austrian citizen, he wasn't really allowed to work officially, only as was. But in reality, he ran, he ran the place. So we, when we got married in 1944, that's where I moved also to the, to the wars. And how long did you stay in Switzerland? I we stayed in Switzerland in 1946. In 1946, 95-45, the war ended. And, and we stayed till Yes, yes. And when did you hear about the two boys? Pardon? When did you finally hear about the, the two boys that you didn't know if you had saved or... One second. But then I met him six years. Here. Years so then we moved to yes, yes. So what what happened? I had dropped them. I told you I took them to this to this yeah. home. And I heard that they liquidated this place and all these years I really felt where we were we were terrible. I mean I knew I did the best I could under the circumstances. Nobody could do better better what I did. But nevertheless I was thinking quite a bit. Now, we left to Switzerland, we moved on to Israel. And we moved to Jerusalem. We had, I had some French friends that live right around the corner from me, that we played bridge with. And they were friends, they were, they were this lady, was a very special lady. They lived in Paris and they were, I don't remember all the details. They were in the French underground, I think. Yeah, 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 he was in the French underground. That was a special, nice, nice, nice couple. And I went to them, come to the house. And there was an elderly gentleman and he introduced him to me. Like it was very polite, he said, it's so kind. And he said, Simcha Aaron, he said, Eli Brown, whatever. And as he walked out, I said, what did you say his name was? She said, Simcha Aaron. I said, I know who this is. <laughs> they called him back. I was, that moment, I was sure this was his name. It wasn't Simcha at the time, his name was Freddy. But Aaron, they called him back. He was down the steps already, comes back. So I, I, I was blessed with a very good memory. So this elder man, man comes back, I asked him, were you born in Düsseldorf? He said, yes. I said, were you in Belgium? Yes. Were you in that crazy train that went from Belgium to France? He said, yes. I said, I am Ellie. He forgot my name. But through these two, three questions, he knew who I am. After 61 years, <coughs> I met this guy. He remembered her as the girl on the bicycle. Because I took him, did I tell and you? He remembered, he remembered that you took him on the bicycle. How could he forget? How he was he 11 forget? years old. How could he, he didn't forget? He remember her name. Yeah, but he didn't remember her And his man. brother survived as well? His brother survived as well. So he, he overcame the pneumonia, thank God, because there was no antibiotics. Unbelievable. 61 years later, 
I said, I'm Ellie. That moment something opened in his head, in his brain that he never, he forgot my name, but he didn't forget the story, the story stuff. Now the next part of the story, he had to go, what did I say, he had to go back to Paris. No, he, he got married. What happened? Oh, he married a psychologist. Yeah. But they, 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 didn't, yes. they didn't liquidate the, the so-called orphanage. That remained? No. The, it was the other one. It was another one. Oh, it was the other orphanage in Moscow. Yeah, whatever. So 61 years, I said I'm Ellie. He forgot my name, but he remembered oh. the age. And you didn't recognize his face? He, through the years he was 11 years old yeah, he and now he was uh, and, and yeah. wait, he owns an apartment in the next building this is a 30 years did you it's ever hear of such a thing he, in, yes in the same street yes you must probably day. saw each other Never. but he lived in Paris but he owned an apartment right next to your apartment pardon right in the same street Yes, almost. And I passed his house and he had been there, listen. But he lives in Paris and he is a, became a very, very famous musicologist and was a violinist in the Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra right next to my house. Which is played at the Jerusalem Theatre. What? They played the Jerusalem Theatre. Right over here, the theatre at the Jerusalem Theatre. Which is right next to where you live. Would you believe it? It's never encountered him. Sixty-one years later, they said, I'm Ellie. He forgot my name, but he never forgot just the story. Tell him about Vienna. Do you want to tell and, him? And that what saved, and you Esther? saved his life. Do you want to tell amazing. him the story about Vienna then? What he organized? Let's talk about Harry. Tell the story of Harry. Oh, Harry's story yes. too? Okay, that was, that was, <laughs> oh, that story was, that was him. his, that was his story. How did Harry story? Yeah, I was, we fled to, from Belgium, Vienna, I told you, that's to Belgium. No, you were in France. Yeah, just a minute, from Belgium we fled to France. And in France, we fled with, with, a, with a woman who was highly pregnant with a little girl that told him. We helped all this and this and this and this and this and this. And one day, this woman's I say, nephew, step-nephew, whatever it was, fled from a camp it's in, 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 in France from an internment camp, and he fled. He heard that she's there, 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 and she said she was highly pregnant already, and they had only one room and a little kid, whatever. So this guy fled from a camp. He was related to her, but she couldn't uh, take care of. You know, you know, he was 18 years old. I was also 17, 18, 17, and how did she go with Harry? So my parents, he was, he was also from Vienna, and he didn't have his parents, he didn't know where his parents were, he was interned in this camp, and he fled. He was alone, he came, a shirt, and his pants, with a torn pants from the barbed wire he escaped the camp. So torn this, all over, all his the pants were completely wow. torn from the barbed wire. Yeah, from this also. My mother somehow helped him, what do you call it? So, so, sewed it up a little, sewed it up a little bit. This is how he came. He was 18 and I was 17. When he was 19, I was 18, yes, sir. So, my parents had terrible, terrible pity on him and they took him in. We had only this one room. They took the Harry. Wow. <laughs> just, just the craziest thing at that. They took in Harvey and we shared whatever my parents said, whatever. Did I tell you this about Rosh Hashanah? Did yes, tell them about, about the Rosh Hashanah. He came a few days before Rosh Hashanah, right? Yeah, yeah, came a few days. So my parents had terrible pity on him. 
and we became very friendly. My parents were, so to say, celibate, so, so good parents, so to say. And we became very friendly, Dr. Harry and I. Because from Vienna, from the same neighborhood, <laughs> whatever, I knew his, I knew his stepmother, I didn't know his mother, whatever it was. So, we became very close friends. Not because boy and girl, mm. just friends, mm. you know, friends like cousins, very close, close, close cousins. So we were always hungry. Went to the sun, they had a sticky minion there, we went out to the forest, and we were so hungry, and we ate, uh, what was it, raspberries, what did I say it was? Blueberries. Blueberries, mm -hmm. that's blueberries, that's blueberries. We took the blueberries, also shown from the. We didn't pull them; we ate them like that. You know, later on we felt so bad, also shown but but we did it. I'm just telling you, Harry, Harry, and Harry, and I. We became very good. My parents took care of him, <laughs> like it adapted really, really in every, in every which way. And then he decided he was afraid because he was illegal. We were legal, sort of, but he was illegal and he was afraid, so he decided. Also, we were also afraid, you know, just us, but he decided he's gonna. He's gonna leave, he's gonna go maybe to the city, maybe he'd be. He was utterly alone, sorry. Mm. But I tell you, we became very close. Also, my parents yes. treated him like that, really, really, really like that. So I didn't know what happened to No, no, no. What he decided, he got wrote to me and I wrote him back. I was his only lifeline, wow. you hear what I'm saying? Because his parents, his father had remarried and they fled to Belgium. He didn't know where, what, how, what, 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 so, so, so. So, how did he go with Harry? So, so he fled and he joined the... Yeah, he joined that, yes. He decided, what should he do? He will join the Foreign Legion. You know what the, the Foreign Legion? The French Foreign Legion. Pardon? The French, the French Foreign, Foreign Legion. Yeah, also you're familiar. So they sent him, they sent him to North Africa because it was a French colony, Algeria. Algeria and I forgot what was the other country. Forgotten. I forgot right now, next show, whatever it's called, I forgot right now. So they sent him, okay, send him to Algeria, and he wrote to me from Algeria, and I wrote him back, and I wrote him first, and my, I was his only li lifeline, really. Yes, yes, for another one. And this is during the war? Yes, yeah, during the war. Was it Morocco? Morocco. Part of Morocco. Yes, there Morocco. Was, uh, Spanish that's Morocco, Morocco, French Morocco. French, yeah. French Morocco. That's were, they were Algeria. Jews that, yeah, that spoke French in Morocco. Yes, yeah. French Morocco and Algeria. That's it. Yeah. So I was his own and I wrote him back and he wrote me and I wrote me. And we liked each other an awful lot. You know, liked, liked, not loved. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know? yeah. Liked, 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 liked. And what forgot what happened then, Esther? And then. Uh, you, okay, you I fled over the mountains to Switzerland and you lost okay, touch with yeah, That's what it is. We fled to Switzerland and I lost touch with him. Completely, completely. I didn't Never know. heard of him again. Yeah. I was wondering what in the world happened to Harvey, you know? We were very fond of each other, not in love, yeah, yeah. fond. Very, very, very. Meantime, I got married and I was in Switzerland and we fled to be to America. And then we decided, I was wondering what happened to Harvey. You know, I had both were very fond of each other. We yeah. had just a such a thing. My parents, but I can't tell you what good people my parents were. So, go to the, come, we move to Israel. I go to, move to Jerusalem. Was it we go, we were members in a great synagogue, my husband liked the country, you know. Go, we go, go to the great synagogue, I had my seat there, pun, next to me sits a lady, and she has her marks and she checks where she has, you know, where, where the plane. 
så jeg er så kan jeg hjælpe jo. Jeg er friendly på os, så skal Så er jeg så... Og den er så... Så she said, den er spukt over en French, vi kan tåle. Så er det noget at speak English, så vi kan tørre med spukter. Så she said, ja, så. Så she opened up, så jeg opened up her mars, så jeg siger den nem gældbart. So I said to her, you know, during the war I was together with a guy, we became, his name was Harry Gelbart. I have never heard from him again, it's 60, I don't know, whatever, how many, I can't remember, man. So many years, and my was in 60 at that time, I was poor, I forgot, I mean, but she didn't answer, she didn't say anything. So, but I told her the story. I mean, she, I would have thought she would react yeah. because it's not such a it's not such a common name either. Yeah, it's not such a common name in not a brown. Yeah. Okay, it could be say fifteen browns, but again. So I said to her, which we didn't. Then I said, "Do you know who I'm talking about?" She said, "It's my husband." <gasps> He's sitting down it. there, you see in the great wow. synagogue. That's a great synagogue. He's sitting you know? down, you see, you see this man with this uh, whatever couple or whatever kippa he's wearing. Said so after that after the services I meet my husband. I had always met him at a certain place. And I held on to her, said, Wait a minute, we'll come. I said, It's a come with me, we'll we like to we'll see. So yeah, she see this woman, she walked over. Then comes a man, well-dressed, a tall, well-dressed, very good, I'm not saying good looking, but impressive looking man, like the covered, very, very, uh, uh, he has some parts, yeah. Distinguished, distinguished. Distinguished, distinguished that's what I want, a very distinguished man, yeah, distinguished looking man, and I said to him, this woman said to me, this is my husband, I said, I'm Ellie. He had forgotten my name, but he would never forget the story that we had just had together. And your parents? Huh? And how good your parents were to him? My parents were left in Switzerland. Yes, of yeah. course. Yeah, my parents. Were. So I said, I am Ellie. He had forgotten my name, but he had never forgotten me. He said, there was only one Ellie in my life. Wow. He said this. There was only one Ellie in my life. Wow. Well, I would like to tell you. He came here for, he lived in Strasbourg. And he looks like such a distinguished man. There is no way to tell you this emotion that we both had for each other. After all this, after all these years. So my parents had, and my parents hadn't lived, weren't alive anymore, but my sisters, they lived in Switzerland. And we went ever so often to Switzerland. Mm -hmm. So he asked us, when we come to Switzerland next time, we should come to live in Strasbourg. He would like us to come. So, so we said, yeah, we'll be, in, we'll be in touch. Yes, yes, please, please come. So the next time we went to Switzerland, we called him up and he said, of course I want you to, want you to come. So we took a train to Strasbourg. Wow. And then also he said to my husband, we should take along his talus and his uh, talus and fillin and whatever we need, uh, because he would like us to stay overnight. Mm -hmm. So my husband was a good sport, why not, you know? So when I came, we came, he picked us up in Strasbourg from the train station with the limousine, mm -hmm. his, his limousine he had, and he, the first thing he took us to the Bet Knesset, to the synagogue, and he showed us, proudly he just had donated a separate work wow. to this, 
in memory of his parents, I think. And that was the first thing he wanted to show us, how he proud that that he became a somebody after that poor, poor, poor wow. guy with the torn pants. He became a highly distinguished member of the synagogue and we came to his house and he didn't know what to do for us, wow. how to treat us. And he took a tremendous liking to my husband also because they were also from, he was also from Vienna, from the same neighborhood and so. And we had a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous time. And he was so proud and so happy. And so was I. And my husband was also extremely, extremely pleased to to meet him and we were wined and dined in the Did he come out ask when you yes. told his wife Pardon? when you mentioned to his wife yeah. that that you know was she was she very emotional? No, not at all. At How first, come? How come she, she was so taken aback? Maybe she was shocked. Maybe she was so shocked. That's what it was. She was so shocked when I said to her that she couldn't talk. She was choked up. And it was by chance that you sat next to her. By chance. It was Mina Next Shemayin. to me, of sure. It was all Mina Shemayin. And job, sitting next to her, said, can I help The great synagogue you? is a very big synagogue. There are many seats. There are many, many hundreds, seats. Hundreds, hundreds of hundreds. That hundred you would have to be sitting. Dufkes, exactly, next, next to her. And then the way I asked her, can I help you? It's, you uh, see, because you're so helpful and you're such a, a good in care that it could yeah. happen. Yeah, and then I saw the name and she didn't answer, so I just asked her. You know, and I told her the story. It was not such a simple story, it was, but she didn't react. So I said, do you know who I'm talking about? She says, yes, it's my husband. Wow. She was so shaken up that she couldn't really answer. And did you become close with her as well? Yes, yes. Yes, and I tell you what happened then. Then they came and moved to Israel from Strasbourg. And my husband also took a great, great, great liking to him. A very strong, mm -hmm. big, I'm sure because of me, yeah. we had such a kind yeah, of... Yeah, the connection, yeah, the connection. Yes, yes, and he, my husband felt also like the lady I hurried to. And what happened? He got sick. And it, here in Israel, he, I remember, we came, we invited him for Shabbos and they invited us. Yes, yes, yes. And he became sick. And he was in the hospital. And I went to visit him. And then in the hospital also he said to me, like, he held my hand, he was on his deathbed, Aye. he said, for me there was only one Ellie. You know, it was such sure. a, such a, because we went through so, so much. So much together, you know. yeah. It wasn't a love affair or anything. But you went, you, you shared so, sure. We went so much, met, meant, meant so much to each other. But your, your parents saved his life by taking him in. He had tremendous caress at all. Yeah, I remember. With a torn, uh, from, yeah. the, from the from the from the barbed Eddie, did you ever tell the story to the chairman of the show? The chairman of the great synagogue is Asher Shapiro. No, I don't. And he's also from Vienna. Asher Shapiro, the chairman of you. the great I synagogue. I forgot. No, no, Asher Shapiro. I forgot about the name. He was he's, he yeah. he was the chairman for many years of yeah, the great synagogue. No, also from know. Vienna. But I'm sitting next to her in a great synagogue. Incredible. In a great synagogue. And then she, she, she didn't answer. She didn't, she, she was a guest so moved. I think know? she was so shocked. So she, it, yeah. Because what are the... So I said, because she didn't react. I said, she kept on telling this. So, you know, like, I said, do you know who I'm talking about? She says, this is my husband. But when I saw him and we went out again, distinguished man, wow. you know, to a distinguished man, well dressed, wow. well dressed, and he said, 
for me there was uh, only one the, in the, that's what he said also on his deathbed he said this on his deathbed he said it yes yeah Eli, I just want to thank Why? you. I'm just going to come in as well. Oh, Eli, yeah. Eli, I just want to say that there is only one Eli. There really is only <laughs> one Eli. Well, there is only you one Eli. And your to... story and your life and your experience, it's and missing. And your parents, my it's parents just. Were very special but it's people. what Nisim, but one nice after, after another, the others, yes, yeah. and you are such a courageous, such an incredible man, person. Man, you it's you the goodness, your, you goodness know, your goodness, no, your goodness. No, just has to be done. But and your goodness, really, what how you saved, how you went to the the officials to <laughs> plead for their lives. No, no, no. It was it was just my father doing. My father, my father had a tremendous influence upon me. Well, any, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, and to say this has been the God. most incredible experience, yeah, sure. to the greatest good. The greatest honor to meet you and no, to hear no, your story. No, then you make me, and I am so me grateful. Blush. You make me blush. Um, you, I'm so grateful. Yes. And and there is only one any. Well, there is only one any But this is what he said. No, he said for me that I will never forget it because it was so 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 emotional. Thank you so so much. You're very welcome. What was so emotional when you met Harry?